Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Council Member Helen Rosenthal, Chair of the Committee on Women, calling this hearing to order. Today we will discuss abortion and reproductive rights in New York State, as well as hear resolution number 84, sponsored by the public advocate, the current public advocate, Letitia James. The resolution urges the New York State Legislature to pass and the governor to sign the Reproductive Health Act, which I'm going to refer to as HRA. But before we delve into the details of the HRA, let's review some New York State history as it relates to abortion. An individual's right to choose an abortion is an essential component of their personal health, economic mobility, educational opportunities, and career aspirations. When New York State passed its abortion law in 1970, it was taking the lead on advancing women's rights and health. This had an immediate effect. According to a study by the city's own Department of Health, abortion was the leading cause of maternal mortality before legalization. Following legalization of abortion, maternal mortality rates declined by 30%. In 1973, with the decision of Roe v. Wade and in subsequent Supreme Court decisions, further advances were made. As such, New York State's law went from groundbreaking to dated. For instance, under current New York State law, abortion is located in the criminal code rather than the public health law. Self-induced abortion is criminalized. Abortion is illegal after 24 weeks of pregnancy unless the life of the pregnant person is at risk, meaning that the health of the pregnant person is not an exception. Also, it is ambiguous currently whether non-medical doctor health professionals, such as nurse practitioners or midwives, are permitted to perform an abortion. Now, the Reproductive Health Act addresses each and every one of those concerns. Abortion will be regulated in the public health code rather than in criminal law. Self-induced abortion will no longer be criminalized. The health of a pregnant person will be an exception to late-term abortion restrictions, and it will be made clear that nurse practitioners physician assistants, and licensed midwives can perform abortions. I know that many of the advocates that are set to testify today and welcome are only able to do so because the state, the Senate, Ju the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee has delayed its vote on the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. If the Senate were to confirm Judge Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court, there is a very real concern that Roe v. Wade would be overturned. Were this to be the case, we would find the progress made to the right of a pregnant person to access safe and legal abortion undone. And all New Yorkers would be especially vulnerable to the negative consequences. I guess, fortunately, that vote has been delayed, and I trust that our U.S. Senators will listen and believe in people who are testifying under oath. But that aside, also at present, Public programs, including Medicaid and Title X National Family, the National Family Planning Program, are crucial to providing women with access to affordable contraceptive services 
and information. These two are under attack from a Trump administration that is dead set on undermining reproductive freedom. In sum, the progress of the past several decades is under serious and considerable threat. And it is crucial that New York State take the lead again on protecting the right to choose. The Reproductive Health Act would address the flaws in the state's existing abortion laws. And it will signal that our state will protect every New Yorker's right to access abortion amidst the considerable threats coming from the federal level. I look forward to having the public advocate speak on her resolution in favor of the Reproductive Health Act, as well as hearing testimony from State Senator Kruger, who is the leading sponsor of the act in the New York State Senate. I would like to thank the staff of the Committee on Women, including Council Brenda McKinney, Policy Analyst Chloe Rivera, Legal Fellow Rabia Kasim, and Finance Analyst Dan Krupp for all their help in preparing for this hearing, as well as my Legislative Director, Sean Fitzpatrick, and my incoming Legislative Director, Ned Terrace. I would ask that this body be patient uh, with our public advocate, Letitia James. She will be here just as quickly as possible, and when she is, I will ask everyone's patience by interrupting their testimony in order to give her a chance to talk about their resolution. But for right now, I'd like to call up to the panel State Senator Liz Kruger from the East Side and Jacqueline Ebanks, who is our Executive Director of the Commission on Gender Equity. I say our, but I should say the Mayor's Commission on Gender Equity, but on which I proudly serve. And I'm gonna turn it over to my legislative um, direct uh, counsel to uh, issue the oath. If you can please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. So I'm going to beg the indulgence of the public and this committee and ask and the administration to ask that State Senator Kruger testify first, given her very busy day today. So thank you and welcome. I did not submit testimony because I figure the bill you're um, discussing today and everyone will be testifying is my testimony. I'll just say briefly why it is so critical. And you, you, know, you read in your opening remarks pretty much all the reasons. But on a personal level, so there's not that many gray-haired people in this room. I'm next to you. <laughs> so in 1976, as a college student in the Midwest, I trained with Planned Parenthood to do birth control um, counseling and they would give you like a, a suitcase like a fuller brush man with all kinds of birth control in it and you would go out and you would talk to people about access to birth control and their options and reproductive health and because it was only three years after Roe v. Wade and the Midwest always things trickle down a little more slowly the concept of actual access to abortion as a legal right was still not totally there. And so I would talk to women who had gone through illegal abortions even after 1973 because they didn't know they had a right to legal. And I would hear the horror stories from women who had had to go to people who might not be trained professionals, perhaps in a unsanitary situation, uh, perhaps ending up in the emergency room because of botched procedures. And I talk to young people today about the importance of establishing the state law because we may be losing all those rights at the federal level. And I just wanna emphasize, a lot of the younger people don't actually understand what it would be to live in a country 
that didn't give them access and the right to decide to end their pregnancy for whatever reasons in a healthy, safe place with medical providers. So while I've carried the bill that you are going, your resolution supports, really since Elliot Spitzer was the governor, so that's going back a few years, and the assembly has passed it multiple times and the Senate has yet to pass it, when people say, why now? I don't feel like I have to explain that anymore. Thank you, Donald Trump. Um, hmm. Because we're at literally the door of losing our right to reproductive health and safe abortion opportunities and access and even access to birth control. Um, in 2018, in New York State. So I'm just simply committing to everybody who's testifying here today, help me get this across the finish line. If we have a Democratic Senate in January, I know this isn't a partisan um, council hearing, um, but actually the Republicans in New York City are pro-choice too, thank you very much. Um, so we need a Democratic Senate and we will pass this bill and I am perfectly confident the governor will sign it and we will finally, for the first time, actually have the protections we need in New York State because I think that some people will testify today that even though we've had a certain law on the books and we've had Roe v. Wade, we haven't had the right law on the books and particularly for women who have to make decisions, incredibly difficult decisions in the later term of their pregnancy to need an abortion for health and safety reasons, life reasons, um, the fact that their doctors have explained they're putting their lives at risk. There is no viability to continue the pregnancy. They have to leave New York State and find health care in three other states far, far away at enormous cost to themselves. So this is critical even if we weren't literally at the door of ending access nationally. But we are, and so we're actually at the emergency responder moment. So I see the city council and city elected officials working with the state to pass a law that's literally a first responder emergency action. So thank you, Helen, and your committee for I know you will move this resolution after this hearing today. And thank you for letting me testify. Absolutely, I actually do have one uh, political but not um a uh, political question, yes. uh, a question of fact yes. for you, and then we're going to hear from the public advocate. Um, now, could you explain to me today um, or this past year why you couldn't get the bill passed? You mentioned that you have some Republican senators who would vote for it. What, why then? hasn't been it been able to pass? Is that not a descriptive question? That's fine. Um, in the past few years. So life in Albany is different than here in New York City and the city council. The only way a bill comes to the floor of the Senate for a vote is if the majority leader decides it can come for a vote. So if you have, you need 32 votes to pass a bill, there are bills that have 38 sponsors. This, my bill is not one of them, but you have bills with 38 sponsors that you cannot get to the floor for a vote because if Majority Leader John Flanagan decides it's not coming for a vote, it's not coming for a vote, and there is nothing in the rules of the Senate that actually can work to allow you to move a bill over the objection of the Majority Leader. If the Democrats are in the majority come January, John Flanagan will not be reelected majority leader. I'm pretty sure that Andrea Stewart Cousins will be elected majority leader with the Democratic Senate. And she has been the number two co-sponsor of this bill the entire time she has been in the Senate. So I am very sure, and I have asked her and anyone else could, Will she bring this floor, this bill to the floor for a vote? Yes, she will. If we're in the majority, we will have 32 votes. And I've been checking very carefully, and there's not one anti-choice Democrat 
in the Senate or running for the Senate. May I ask a follow-up question? Um, the mood in the city has been very um, uplifted by an anti-IDC vote. So many, if not all, of the anti-IDC, six of seven, I think, were, um, or five of six were. Six of eight were. Thank you. Six of eight were elected. Does that make a difference in terms of uh, the Senate electing a Democrat as its majority leader? Excellent question, and complicated, but yes, I believe it does, because over the last eight years, at least half the time, there was a Democratic numerical majority, and we should and could have been the majority except for the fact that the IDC members, in exchange for leadership titles and perks, gave their allegiance to John Flanagan to make sure that we didn't have the votes to take back the majority or pass endless bills that were important to us, and now we won't have that storyline. With apologies yes. for interrupting, I'd like to really ask again. Okay. Um, it's my understanding that there's still a senator who would, even though he's elected as a Democrat, uh, caucuses with the Republicans. Simka Felder. And he was so never an IDC member. If Simka Felder gets elected and continues to caucus with the Republicans, and there are no other changes in the state Senate, would you be able to elect a Democratic Senate leader? My understanding is no, which implies that there's more work to be done before this can happen. Am I misunderstanding something? No, no, I, I, I said multiple times, if we are in the majority in January, that requires we win more Democratic seats in November. So I wasn't counting Simka Felder as one of the Democrats. Um, because while he runs on the Democratic line as well as the Republican line, the day he got to Albany, he went into the Republican conference room. Um, so I don't even think it's fair to label him a Democrat on behalf of Democrats. Um, so yes, we need more Democrats. You need 32 Democrats. My optimistic self thinks we will have at least 34 or 35 Democrats after the November election. So should people contact you offline in order Not in my government office, but yes, people can reach me in a lot of ways, and I'd be happy to coordinate them and direct them to non-governmental um, non work that okay. they might be interested in. I just in. want to focus on that at that hearing oh. in this moment because it's not that people can rest on their laurels. There is still work to be done. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I appreciate it. Appreciate your time. We have the public advocate here. We're going to hear from her. Thank you so much for stopping by today, State Senator. Thank Ruger. you very much, Council Member. All right. Uh, public advocate Tish James, who is the lead sponsor on this resolution, welcome and congratulations on a recent victory. Thank you. I want to thank um, the chair, Helen Rosenthal, for holding this hearing today and for being a friend and for being an uncompromising and tireless fighter for the basic principles that women's rights are human rights. Um, and I cannot believe that in 2018 that we're still demanding freedom and protection uh, to make personal choices about our bodies. Um, it reminds me of uh, a uh, T-shirt that I saw recently that, um, well, it uses a lot of foul language, but it basically says, I can't believe that we're still fighting for this stuff. Um, so the right to make our own decisions uh, about what happens to our own bodies is a fundamental human right, and these decisions should be made between a woman, her doctor, and her, and whatever God she chooses uh, to pray to, or even if she chooses not to pray to any God, it's basically a personal decision. It's not a decision left up to this illegitimate president or to this illegitimate Supreme Court nominee um, who sought to prevent an unaccompanied minor 
an immigrant from obtaining a legal abortion and uses and used the law, twisted the law, uh, to basically uh, come to that conclusion. Or Neil Gorshik, who believes corporations have a religious right to prevent their employees from lawfully obtaining contraception, and not by any gaggle of privileged men sitting comfortably in the halls of power who know and care nothing of the challenges of being a woman, let alone being the challenges of a woman of color. Uh, New York was once a pioneer when it came to protecting reproductive rights. Uh, we were one of the first states in the nation to decriminalize abortion three years before Roe versus Wade. And yet, as we sit here today, New Yorkers' access to reproductive health care is in greater peril than any time in nearly 50 years. Uh, a man who bragged about committing sexual assault occupies the White House for now. And he's trying to confirm another man accused of assault uh, to a lifetime appointment to the highest court in the land. And even if these men weren't credibly accused of sexual violence, their public positions on personal autonomy and reproductive rights are poisonous. And in fact, the conduct they are, that they are engaging in right now and the process that they are engaging in in denying a woman the right to testify before the, before the, uh, the state Senate, the United States Senate, is also um, an, uh, offensive. And I hope that women stand up. And um, as an aside, I recognize that there is um, a wave of blue coming, but I'm hoping that there's a wave of pink coming um, in strong numbers. As it is, the Trump administration is already taking regressive steps to dismantle women's reproductive rights. For example, with their proposed rule changes to Title 10, um, the uh, Federal Family Planning Program, which I let a, um, uh, penned a letter on um, before my life changed. Um, and the proposed rule change will prevent medical uh, providers from giving complete objective medical counseling, which violates medical ethics and disempowers women and girls from being able to choose their desired family, uh, their planning method, and including abortion. And several weeks ago, I joined with groups like Planned Parenthood of NYC and sub submitted comments to the federal government uh, opposing this rule change. And we recognize this as just another tactic of the Trump administration to roll back our rights. So if they get their way, it is not a matter of if Roe versus Wade is overturned, but a matter of when. And as a state, we are not prepared to protect the fundamental right to abortion from federal assault. And th therefore, we've got to harden our laws. And as it currently stands, unless a pregnancy is life-threatening, it is against New York State law to terminate a preg pregnancy after 24 weeks, even if it is necessary to protect a woman's health or the fetus is not viable. And shockingly, abortion remains in the state penal code listed alongside homicide. Let me say that again. Believe it or not, in New York State, abortion remains in the state penal code, and it's listed alongside of homicide. New York remains one of only seven states that has such a law. Um, and uh, if I get the opportunity to introduce uh, state legislation, um, those are one of my bills that we will be introducing in the first 100 days. For years, we have seen the Reproductive Health Act stall in Albany because people said there was no danger to New Yorkers. But now we have a present and real danger, and our fundamental rights are under assault and at genuine risk. Last year, 19 states adopted 63 different restrictions on abortion rights and access. And with these new laws, 58% of women in the United States currently live in states that are either hostile or extremely hostile to abortion rights. And when Anthony Kennedy announced his retirement, I stood with many elected officials and advocates who called for the state Senate Republicans to return to Albany to pass the Reproductive Health Act. They did nothing. They took no action. They decided it was okay to leave New Yorkers at the Supreme Court mercy, mercy and at President Trump's mercy. Um, and, at the, and as the most important election of our lifetime approaches, I believe New Yorkers deserve to know where their representatives stand on reproductive rights, because the time, is, the time to stand up and be counted is long past due. And when the legislature returns to Albany in January, their first order of business, their first order of business must be to pass the Reproductive Health Act, uncompromised, undiluted, just pass the damn law in, into, um, pass the bill into law and do it now. Damn it. <laughs> um, and then we can begin the multi-year process of codifying reproductive rights into our state's constitutions. And today, 
we lay down the marker. New York must once again lead by example. We stand for reproductive rights. I will stand for reproductive rights, and I will do it with every passion and with every fiber of my being, because I believe that um, what happens between you and your body is no one else's business but yours. Um, Madam Chair, I apologize for cursing, but as someone who has had to lead a number of young girls um, into uh, Planned Parenthood, take them by the hand, counsel them, hold them, uh, because they did not have uh, um, stable families, this issue is personal. And so I thank you for allowing me to say a few words, and I thank you for allowing my bill to be heard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Public Advocate James. Um, do you have any questions for State Senator Kruger? Okay. Thank you so much. We're going to turn now to the administration and hear from Commissioner Ebanks. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Rosenthal. Good morning, Public Advocate James. I want to say a special thank you to uh, Senator Kruger and to Assemblymember Deborah Glick for their leadership in shepherding this bill through the New York State Legislature. As you mentioned, I am Jacqueline Evanks, Executive Director of the Commission on Gender Equity. In this role, I also serve as an advisor to the Mayor and First Lady on policies and issues impacting gender equity in New York City. Established in 2015 and codified into law in 2016, the Commission works with city agencies to remove institutional barriers to equity and to establish inclusive policies and practices which ensure that all New Yorkers, regardless of gender identity or expression, have opportunities to be economically secure, have access to quality and affordable health care, have full autonomy over their reproductive lives, and live safely in their homes and communities. I am pleased to represent the administration today in support of Resolution 84, which urges the New York State Legislature to pass and the governor to sign the Reproductive Health Act in the upcoming legislative session. In a recently filed amicus brief in the United States Supreme Court case of Whole Woman's Health versus the Commissioner of the Texas Department of State Health Services, New York City's leadership in the fight for reproductive justice was described as follows. Before the constitutional right to abortion was established, New York City was one of the few places where women could obtain safe and legal abortions. Hundreds of thousands of women from all over the country, including 3,400 from Texas, traveled to New York City seeking access to abortion services. The brief further states that before New York State became one of the first jurisdictions to legalize abortions, New York City faced a public health crisis. An estimated 50,000 women were having clandestine abortions every year. As a consequence, abortion-related deaths and complications were commonplace. That all changed in 1970 when New York State liberalized its laws to allow abortions up to 24 weeks after conception or at any time thereafter to protect a woman's life." End quote. The de Blasio administration remains committed to implementing holistic and inclusionary reproductive justice policies and services. And since 2014, the administration has ensured that the city's 11 hospitals within its health and hospital network provide expert prenatal care, labor, and delivery services, family planning, comprehensive gynecological services, women's health, and primary care outpatient medical support for women at every stage of life. Also since 2014, the administration and this city council, through various legislative, programmatic, and advocacy actions, have increased access to contraception, including emergency contraception, created the health, Sexual Health Education Task Force to, de to develop strategies for implementing comprehensive sexual health education in New York City public schools. We've offered comprehensive and confidential care for women, including contraceptive counseling, management of pregnancy loss, and elective pregnancy termination in a safe environment. And as noted above, filed amicus briefs to protect reproductive freedom whenever it is threatened in the nation. So, while New York City continues to expand and support comprehensive reproductive health care, 
the Trump administration continues its attack on reproductive health care programs at the federal level. Such was the case on June 1st, as already mentioned, when the administration proposed significant and detrimental changes to the Title X family planning program. In response to these changes, Mayor Bill de Blasio, along with 79 mayors across the nation, sent a letter expressing vehement opposition to the implementation of a domestic gag rule on the Title X family planning program. Additionally, New York City Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services, Dr. Herminia Palacio, submitted the administration's detailed objections to the proposed changes during the public comment. The mayor's letter and Dr. Palacio's comments are attached to the testimony. In the wake of these changes, New York City continues to advocate for maintaining full appropriation to Title X funds. Clearly, current trends place the nation on the precipice of returning to an era when women's right to make her own decision, reproductive decision, belong to everyone else but her. These trends are exacerbated by the complete and willful ignorance to the reproductive rights of transgender and gender nonconforming Americans. Given these sobering realities, from the proposed changes to Title X funding, to the possible appointment of another Supreme Court justice opposed to Roe v. Wade, to the fact that several states have enacted laws limiting women's reproductive rights, and to the denial of reproductive rights and competent medical care for transgender and gender nonconforming Americans, it is incumbent upon the New York State Legislature to secure reproductive justice for all New Yorkers. Therefore, it is with great urgency that the Commission on Gender Equity supports the Reproductive Health Act. The city has always supported the act in the past years and again in 2018 submitted a memorandum of support to this legislature. As already stated, the act would bring New York State into compliance with constitutional law. By providing a, by providing a pregnant individual with the explicit right to access the care necessary when their health is at risk or the fetus is not viable. It also prohibits the prosecution of healthcare professionals that provide abortion services, ensuring that a fear of prosecution is not a barrier to care. And finally, the act would remove the state abortion law from the penal code and place it in the public health law, sending an important signal to medical providers that they need not fear criminal prosecution for treating a patient whose pregnancy is endangering their health. Again, the city's memorandum of support is attached to this testimony. I also want to note that the Reproductive Health Act underscores the importance of access to contraception in securing reproductive rights for all New Yorkers. It's really impressive that it asserts that it is the public policy of the state of New York that every individual has the fundamental right to choose or refuse contraception. Therefore, passing and signing the Reproductive Health Act into law is essential to ensuring the reproductive rights and economic well-being of New Yorkers. As Supreme Court Justice, Assume Court Associate Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg writes in her Hobby Lobby dissent, the ability of women to participate equally in the economic and social life of the nation has been facilitated by their ability to control their reproductive lives. If New York State wants to remain a beacon of progressivism in this nation and the globe, it must lead by providing New Yorkers full autonomy over their reproductive life. As First Lady Charlene McRae stated, reproductive health is not a privilege, it is a right protected by the Constitution. Resolution 84 calls for New York State to assert its leadership for reproductive justice and to protect a woman's right to choose. The administration applauds the City Council for considering this resolution and supports its passage. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to welcome Council Member Ayala, who I believe uh, congratulations are in order for a new birth. Yeah, very exciting, very exciting. That makes you a mother, right? Or 
No. Oh, okay, grandmother. <laughs> you're, so, you're too young to be a grandmother. It's very cool, babies having babies, but I'm all for it. Um, so, uh, Commissioner, thanks so much for your testimony. I wanted to ask, um, in your testimony, you make this really important point um, at the end of page one, where um, you said that an estimated 50,000 women were having clandestine abortions every year. I'm wondering if you have a sense, you know, old data or more recent data of what that number might be today. I don't have an accurate sense at this time, but I know that that information will be available from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and so we can um, get that to you at a later, Great. In, in short order. And, you know, maybe a couple of questions around that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, how many, um, I would want to, just in order to quantify the risk, yes. I'd be interested in knowing you know, uh, how many of the different contraceptive methods are um, provided by New York City uh, Department of Health as well as H&H. &H. Absolutely, yes. Great, I think that'd be helpful. Um, let's see, I'm gonna ask real quickly, do either of my colleagues have questions for the commissioner? Okay. Um, uh, Commissioner, just this will be the last question. Do you think that, is New York City contemplating taking any, um, is, is, is New York City planning or thinking about what might happen should Roe v. Wade be, Wade be overturned and New York State not fixing its own laws, what the impact would be and what the city could do to help in this situation? The city is committed to expanding access to reproductive care and providing comprehensive reproductive services. I think we have continued to do that, certainly through the duration of this administration. When we do our work as the commission, as, as you know, um, we operate in three intersecting areas, economic mobility and opportunity, health and reproductive justice, and safety. And we see them completely related, and consequently the health and reproductive justice options for women, transgender, gender non-conforming individuals really impacts the totality of their life. New York City will continue within those values and principles, and I think we will work with H&H &H and DOHMH to ensure that we continue to protect and stand for a woman's right to choose and for individuals to have full autonomy over their reproductive lives. One question I've always had is whether or not there's something we could codify here in New York City should these things come to pass. And while the state has always said, we don't have to codify these things because we are protected by Roe, I wouldn't want the city to fall into the situation where the state is now, mm -hmm. where it's imperative right. that we pass the Reproductive Health Act. Is there anything that the city could be codifying now we're in full agreement with your sentiment. Um, I have to say that we have not yet, to the best of my knowledge, done that work, uh, but it's definitely something we will take up in the commission and in partnership with Health and Hospitals and Department of Health. And I appreciate IT. that. I Thank appreciate so working with you as we have over yes. this um, past year. And, um, you know, I, I, I just want to clarify, I asked that question because I know you and the administration are so supportive. Yes. You never know who's going to be elected next, as we, <laughs> we all never know. I think have so. experienced. November 2016 has proven to us, but it also calls on us to have urgency and diligence, as you're pointing out, to identify gaps and be the progressive city and state that we need to be. I want to thank you for your partnership. Uh, 
with the commission and the work that we've been doing and also thank uh, Majority Leader Cumbo and uh, Ayala as well as um, Council Member Rivera. So thank you all so much. Thank you very much. And of course, under the leadership of our speaker, Corey Johnson, who gives us the bandwidth to do what's right here. Absolutely. So thank you. I thank appreciate you. your time. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks. We're going to call up a panel, our next panel. Um, if you could come forward. Uh, Plan, um, Rebecca Don from Planned Parenthood of New York City. Uh, Marissa Nadas, a physician, uh, sorry, Dr. Nadas. Um, Heidi Seek from um, Vote Pro Choice. And Ashley Gray uh, from the Center for Reproductive Rights. And Heidi, I apologize, I missed the hashtag. Heidi Seek <laughs> from hashtag Vote Pro Choice. Madam Chair, as the panel comes up, uh, oh, could sorry, I, and I'd like to welcome Councilmember Lander, who has joined us. Thank you, and I just want to say thank you for convening this important hearing. I'd like to sign on to the resolution, and I really appreciate you and the speaker taking leadership here and just raising up the voice of this body to make sure we get the right thing done at the state level. We sure need it. Thank you. Thank you. So we got Lander. Someone checked him off. Okay. Yes. Oops, sorry. Um, can we start with you? Just introduce yourself for the record. No one needs to be sworn in, and we really appreciate your being here. So we'll just move on down. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Oh, I'm oh. so sorry. We happily have so many people here to testify today. We are going to use a clock. Of, uh, we're going to limit testimony, try to limit testimony to two minutes. And do keep in mind that if you have written something and submitted it, this will be on the record. So if you want to summarize your thoughts um, for the purpose of your testimony today, your oral testimony, feel welcome to do that. But um, again, thank you so much for coming. Sure. Hi, I'm Rebecca Don from Planned Parenthood of New York City. I think it's, it's on, but I always think I'm so loud, so I'm surprised. Can't hear me. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Um, good morning. Uh, I am a women's health nurse practitioner and the director of quality management at Planned Parenthood of New York City. And I want to thank the public advocate uh, Letitia James, council members Brandon Rosenthal, Ayala, and Rivera for introducing this important resolution to call on the New York State Legislature to pass and the governor to sign the Reproductive Health Act. Uh, Planned Parenthood of New York City has been a leading provider of sexual and reproductive health care uh, for over 100 years in New York City, and we're reaching approximately 85,000 New Yorkers uh, annually, both with our clinical services and our education programs. Um, I have been a nurse practitioner for 18 years, and uh, working in this field, um, I have seen firsthand the importance of reproductive health care um, to help people live their best lives. And currently I'm the Director of Quality Management at Planned Parenthood New York City, um, and that means I help ensure the quality of our services, and part of that is helping to train other health care providers to provide both reproductive health care and medication abortion services. So I also know firsthand the competency of advanced practice clinicians in providing those services. Um, in my years of experience as a provider and also just working in abortion care um, as both a counselor and a, a volunteer for my entire adult life, um, I've seen firsthand the barriers that uh, New Yorkers face when accessing abortion and sexual and reproductive health care. Patients frequently encounter protesters who physically block health center entrances. They use harassment or intimidation to, uh, to deter, deter them from accessing the care that they need. Um, and then crisis, -pregn uh, crisis pregnancy centers like the one we have right across the street from our Bronx Healthcare Center um, are masquerading as legitimate healthcare providers and they deceive New Yorkers who are trying to ask, access care. So in the face of these and other challenges, it's critical that we work to protect and expand access to abortion and sexual reproductive health care services. Thank Is that you my very two much. minutes? Okay. 
Thank you, and I want to welcome our majority leader, Lori Cumbo, um, to the committee as well. And council member uh, Carlina Rivera, who's here as well. Thank you. And who is co-sponsor of the resolution as well. Please. Good morning. Thank you, council member Rosenthal, for convening this hearing today. And thank you, public advocate James, for introducing the resolution before the committee. My name is Ashley Gray. I'm the state advocacy advisor at the Center for Reproductive Rights. Uh, the Center for Reproductive Rights is a legal advocacy organization dedicated to protecting the rights of women to access safe and legal abortion and other reproductive health care services. For nearly 20 years, we have successfully defended abortion access throughout the United States, including winning the landmark case Whole Woman's Health v. Hellerstead, in which the U.S. Supreme Court reaffirmed the Constitution's robust protections for a woman's decision to have an abortion. The Center strongly supports the RHA and this resolution. Uh, New York has led the country when it comes to the pursuit of access to reproductive health care. Now more than ever, it needs to take steps to protect and increase access to abortion. Roe v. Wade, the landmark Supreme Court case establishing access to abortion as a constitutional right, has been settled law for over 45 years, yet remains under constant attack. President Trump promised that he will only appoint Supreme Court justices who will overturn Roe v. Wade, and with the nomination of Judge Kavanaugh, we can assume that he made good on that promise. We, we now face the greatest threat to reproductive rights in more than a generation. Uh, many provisions of the Reproductive Health Act are even more urgent and relevant in this landscape. Um, the act affirms the right to privacy in New York law, removes outdated criminal penalties, including for self-induction, and clarifies that advanced practice clinicians like nurse practitioners and physician's assistants can perform abortion care within their scope of practice. Um, these medical professionals fill a critical gap in the rural, rural areas of the state and would increase the number of providers to assist with the potential influx of patients from other states if access federally should be gutted. Um, removing abortion access from the criminal code is a critical step in recognizing that abortion is health care and not a crime. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Yep. Good morning. My name is Dr. Marie Sanadash. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal, for, for convening this hearing today. And thank you, Public Advocate James, for introducing the resolution before the committee. As an OBGYN and a fellow of Physicians for Reproductive Health who cares for New Yorkers every day, I am pleased to support resolution number 84. Access to reproductive health services, including abortion care, is vital to a woman's overall health and well being, as well as to the health of her family. Currently, New York regulates abortion in the criminal code, and this is a problem. It means that medical professionals can be deterred from providing medically indicated care. New York law does not include an explicit provision that allows for abortion care throughout pregnancy when a woman's health is at risk, as, pro as protected by Roe v. Wade. And the same goes for when a devastating fetal abnormality exists, which is a situation in which abortion is an option under federal protections. Every pregnancy is different. At times, patients face serious obstetric complications or life-threatening illnesses later in pregnancy. In these devastating circumstances, abortion care may be the safest path forward. However, because current law deters doctors from providing care, our patients are forced to leave the state to get the care they need even when their health is severely compromised. Traveling out of state for care is an enormous additional burden on top of what, for many, has already been a difficult experience. Let me give you an example. A patient of mine, I will call her Ashley, was pregnant with her third child, and she also suffered from lupus. She presented to the hospital in kidney failure and received outstanding care as a multidisciplinary team worked to control her lupus and reverse her kidney failure. However, the weeks passed and her kidneys did not recover. Pregnancy is known to be hard on the kidneys, and it was determined by her medical team that her kidney function would not recover until her pregnancy ended. If this went on too long, it was possible she would never regain kidney function and be on dialysis. Could you take your time and keep going? Okay. Thank you. She chose to terminate her pregnancy, and I was able to assist her with this during the second trimester, and her kidney function did, re did resolve. 
However, if this complication had presented later in the pregnancy, or the course of the illness had been more insidious, she could easily have surpassed the gestational age limit laid out in New York state law. And as her provider, I would not have been protected under state law to provide abortion care. This intrusion into the provider-patient relationship is cruel and is dangerous. As healthcare providers, we best serve our patients when we can act according to scientific evidence and with our best medical judgment. In cases of health risks and fetal conditions detected later in pregnancy, our patients, who are often struggling with complicated decisions, need access to the best care for their individual circumstances. In the face of dire threats to abortion access on the federal level, it is absolutely crucial to protect New Yorkers' health and rights. And I urge the committee to pass this resolution, calling on New York State to pass this important legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. I also want to welcome Councilmember Kalos, who uh, joined the committee. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Rosenthal, for having this hearing, and I acknowledge the public advocate's amazing resolution as, the other, as well as the other council members who are supporting this. My name is Heidi Seek. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Vote Pro-Choice. We're a nationwide political engagement project that engages millions of pro-choice voters to, with the largest progressive pro-choice voter guide, and we elect pro-choice champions in every election where reproductive freedom is at stake. And let me be very, very clear, reproductive freedom is at stake right now. Um, I'll summarize my testimony by making two points. Um, I've been fighting for reproductive freedom for almost 30 years when I got my first job at Planned Parenthood in Lincoln, Nebraska. And that was a, it's been a perilous three decades of losses and wins, but mostly losses. And we are in a dire situation now. I come to you, um, I came to Vote Pro-Choice and New York as the former president of the San Francisco Women's Political Committee, where we focused on creating a coalition, then led with um, District Attorney Kamala Harris, where we created a collaborative of elected officials, um, committee, com uh, um, reproductive rights organizations, women's organizations, labor unions, and political leaders to create gender equity and reproductive freedom in the state, in the city of San Francisco. And according to the National Institute of Reproductive Health Local Index, we are one of the most pro-choice cities along with New York. There's a lot we can do. And that is, uh, I look forward to working with all of you to make that a reality here because the second, the second um, thing I would like to highlight is um, I was down in the Senate Judiciary Committee two weeks ago, the first person in the hearing, the fourth person to get arrested. I looked into the eyes of Congressman Cong or Chairman Grassley and let me tell you, these leaders are determined to take away our rights. The threat is real. If there are 13 bills that are going to be coming toward the Supreme Court now that will gut Roe v. Wade, and if they are gutted, four states with trigger bans will actually prevent women from getting um, re abortion care in those states. We must do whatever it takes to make sure that our state laws are shored up and providing access and real care to the women of America. And it can start here in New York. Like we've led before, we can lead again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, would any of my colleagues like to ask a question? No? Um, sorry, Council Member Kalos? No, okay. Um, so thank you all for coming. I especially want to thank uh, the doctor for coming because it's helpful to us to hear real life experiences. That's the part that, you know, we don't hear as often. We think more in the abstract. And while we can look at numbers or, you know, the data or quality, we don't know what you're experiencing day to day. And the example you gave of um, uh, which is one where somebody should, for her own health, have access to an abortion, but you, even as somebody who believes that you know abortion should be available, would not feel comfortable doing it because of the New York State criminal uh, penal law um, is a very powerful one. So I appreciate your telling it. I've heard other similar stories as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. I'm going to invite up the next. Oh, I'm so sorry. Major oh, my. 
A uh, quick question to our public advocate, Tish James, to be followed by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo. Thank you. Ms. Syke, is that how you pronounce it? Seek, I apologize. Are, uh, are you working with the state Senate? Have you ad identified some senatorial districts in New York as part of your um, voter pro-choice campaign? And what districts are you focusing on? Your microphone is off. Um, the voter guide focuses on two, it, two parts. We endorse candidates and then we also recommend candidates. So the endorsed candidates have been, we, all, we endorsed eight candidates um, for the state senate and those have been um, the folks that got elected um, against the IDC members. And so going forward in the general, have you identified any, um, any, any seats or districts that we can flip? We are going to be recommending the most pro-choice um, candidates in each of the districts. So we'll be evaluating those and be posting them at the beginning of October. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I wanted to ask a question in regards to um, what we would consider abortions that take place uh, later on in the process. And so you spoke very eloquently about the issue around health-related issues that might cause a woman to have uh, to terminate a pregnancy later on than anticipated because of health reasons. But I remember going on a tour um, at Planned Parenthood and they spoke about the fact that the reason why there may be women that are coming in the fourth and fifth and later on months could have something to do with health complications, but a lot of it also has a lot to do with um, women that are forced to travel um, from state to state because in their own hometown or their own state, they can't have those services performed. And so they actually um, discussed, which was very heartbreaking, the experience that many women have in terms of having to take off a day, two days, three days from work to be able to travel um, out of town, to be able to stay there, and then to travel back, to go back to their hometown, and the ability to actually uh, come up with the money and the resources in order to take that journey. Is that more often the reason, or is it more often health-related reasons um, that find a woman having to terminate a pregnancy later on in the cycle? Thank you. Um, there are many contributing factors to why women may present later on. Um, and some of those reasons are related to a delay in access to care, um, such as what you're describing. And some of those are related to simply their health condition or the fetal anomaly being diagnosed later on. Um, I can give you an example. A colleague of mine just this past week took care of a woman who had her fetus had been diagnosed with a lethal anomaly, and unfortunately, due to our current law, she wasn't able to access abortion care in our state. Um, and related to the delays that she incurred, she ultimately had to travel out of state, out of New York, to another state and was 30 weeks pregnant by the time she was able to actually access mm. her abortion in another state. Um, and it's embarrassing to me that she was a patient, she was a woman of ours, of our state, she went to another state and they experienced her later on because of the delays she had experienced here in New York. Um, unfortunately, that story also involves the fact that she couldn't afford to access all of her care out of state, so she was forced to travel out of state to initiate her abortion care and then return to New York State to complete her care. So you can only imagine the experience that she had. What is the experience that many women face that live in a state where they don't have access. Mm -hmm. What are we finding that they do if they do not actually travel outside of their state? What do illegal abortion options, illegal, look like in a state? And do we know the health outcomes for women that participate because they have no other choice? Mm -hmm. I think that's a great question. It's hard for me to speak to that specifically because I'm fortunate enough to be practicing here in New York. So mm -hmm. I'm not directly taking care of those women and I'm only hearing those stories from other colleagues. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for your service and thank you for the work that you do. Oh, you wanted to speak to that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to chime in. I'm the state advocacy advisor for the Center for Reproductive Rights. So we track and monitor um, restrictive and proactive legislation in all 50 states. And what we're seeing in states like Texas is women crossing the border to get medication abortion in Mexico. Um, we're also seeing a higher um, rate of self-induction. Um, and the self-induction language, especially um, in the, the New York criminal code right now, um, is disproportionately affects um, women of color and women of lower income um, backgrounds um, who, who don't have access or, or have um, financial barriers to seek the care they need and try to take matters into their own hands. And so um, that's another aspect of why the Reproductive Health um, Act is so important to New York women. And can you give me that term again? Self-induction? Or what does that actually look like? Uh, it's self-managed abortion. So this day and age, it's um, abortion pills. It's two pills that you take. Um, I'm sure the the providers can um, explain more about the pills. But it's we're we're um, it's it's women who take um, one pill to um, to um, stop the pregnancy, and then another to induce a miscarriage. And. At what stage of a pregnancy can you do that and it be effective? Uh, before 12 weeks, uh, before around nine to 10 weeks is and, when it's most safe, yes. And are we finding that people or women are doing it after that time frame? I can't speak to that, um, but I am happy to follow up with partners at the Guttmacher Institute who track things like this and um, I can provide more information later. I think, I, I appreciate that because I think that that would be it's important for us to know what's happening also in states where women don't have access mm -hmm. so that way we can all speak more um, powerfully mm -hmm. to what the issue is and what it's going to mean and what it is meaning um, if on the federal level these horrific, archaic mm -hmm. laws see the light of day we have to be able to push back with an understanding of the impact that it's going to have on the lives of women, particularly women in low-income communities and of color. Absolutely. Thank you. And if I could chime in, just to be clear, uh, self-induction is also happening here in New York. Um, women in poor communities and who don't uh, maybe have language barriers and access barriers are actually getting these pills from bodegas and other places where they're actually, um, we, so we sometimes do see women who've self-induced who are coming in for follow-up care or who've had mm. a, an unsuccessful abortion. So this is something that does happen in New York State as well. Thank you. Councilmember Kalis, did you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember and uh, Chair of the Women's Committee. Uh, Helen Rosenthal, as well as all of the sponsors of this amazing resolution, our speaker, our public advocate, Tish James, who we will miss dearly, but we will have fighting for us on a higher level very soon. Councilmember Rosenthal and uh, Ayala and Rivera. I want to touch on the, the services here in New York City for family planning. So when, when I was a, a Younger man, I, I found myself at Planned Parenthood more often than not in terms of doing things like getting tested with somebody that I might be dating and making sure that we're planning around whether or not we wanted a family. And I can tell you at that time I was not interested uh, and, and neither were they. What kind of access do s public school students have in New York City? Do college students have and do low in, do just everyday New Yorkers regardless of income have to these services and are they being provided at school based health centers and what kind of services are available in a school building versus a referral out and how does that whole process work? Um, well I can tell you in terms of um, Planned Parenthood of New York City we are able to access Title X funds so um, for low income um, folks of all ages, um, regardless of age, we are able to provide um, service, reproductive, um, you know, sexual and reproductive health care services um, to all New Yorkers, uh, regardless of income. So, um, in terms of exactly what's happening at school-based health clinics, I'm not 
I'm not sure, but um, you know, we also have education programs, so we're really committed to teaching New Yorkers about reproductive and sexual health care. You mentioned uh, Title X. You mentioned uh, a word that used to make me feel warm and fuzzy under a previous president. You said the word federal. Uh, if there is, and I'm not sure if this question was already asked, but if there is a cut to federal uh, Title X funds, what does that look like, at least in New York City, and how much would the city council uh, probably be more than glad to, to put in to make sure that you can continue the great work that you do? I think the last statistic I heard of Planned Parenthood of New York City is about a quarter of our budget is coming from Title X funds, so it's very significant to us um, having those funds available. We are committed to um, providing those services to patients regardless of income. It's really important to not just um, teenagers, but there may be, you know, in terms of protecting confidentiality, it's really important to um, young people who may have their parents' insurance that they're able to access health care on their own. So we, we really need those funds. It's really important to us to keeping New Yorkers healthy. And so what's that price tag? That I would, I would have to ask my, my, non, my non-healthcare provider colleagues about that. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. I know you had more questions. We're trying to wrap up because we have a beautiful child here, and we're going to have his father come testify next. Um, and I, I know he needs to get a move on. So thank you, Councilman Kalos. Thank you, everyone, for your testimony today. I'd like to now call up um, Mr. Marshall. I don't want Grannon, Marshall, Garen. Thank you. Um, Emily Cater from the National Institute for Reproductive Health, Lauren um, Riker from Reproductive Health Access Project, and uh, Tashinia Diaz from Peer Health Exchange. And Mr. Marshall, um, I'd like you to go speak whenever you want to speak, possibly first, and don't feel you need to stay if you need to if, if you get a little distracted. <laughs> All right. So just be sure to turn on the microphone. You'll see the red button and speak into the mic. Thank you. If you could start, Mr. Marshall. Thank you. Um, and thank you for accommodating my little situation. Um, uh, I wanted to come today just to share my story and share a story of um, some other patients that my wife and I help represent. Um, Our story, uh, my wife and I were uh, 30 weeks into a fairly complicated pregnancy when we got um, very disturbing news about the pregnancy. We found out that there was a development that meant that the baby, if if born, would not be able to breathe. Um, And again, this was discovered at 30 weeks. Uh, when we got this diagnosis. So in that moment, we were obviously crushed. We were heartbroken. It was very much a wanted pregnancy, and um, it had been very difficult all 30 weeks through that pregnancy. Um, And when we got this news, we did what most people do when they get bad news from a doctor. They sort of ask their doctor, okay, well, what do we do? You know, what do we do now? So, um, and, and that's, that's the moment that I want to focus on because our doctor was not able to then suggest a course of action that they could help us with. They could not treat us. Um, we found out that uh, my wife's health would also be threatened in this situation. She had had a brain surgery the year before, and um, if she went into spontaneous labor, she could die. Mm. So we were in a situation where we wanted to sort of avoid undue suffering on the part of a potential child who might live for moments and then choke for air and die. And also to avoid any risk to my wife's health um, and ensure her fertility beyond that. And I'm glad we did that. So, um, but that's when we found out about New York State's law, uh, that we were past the cutoff at 24 weeks. Our only option was to travel out of state for care, 
there are three providers in the country that will treat patients in situations like ours that late in pregnancy and take patients from out of state. They're in New Mexico, Colorado, and Bethesda. Our doctor had had good outcomes with patients he had sent to Colorado, so we went there. Um, when we were arranging a course of care, um, we found out that normally the procedure costs around $25,000. Oh my God. Uh, it's, you have to pay it up front, out of pocket. Um, and that's because uh, they, insurance companies don't often reimburse people for care. Um, and obviously you're forced out of network in this situation. And we simply didn't have the resources for that. Uh, due to my wife's specific situation, we were able to, um, uh, like the patient, uh, the provider mentioned, uh, we got the first part of the procedure in Colorado, which is a shot, and then flew back and had the induction at Sinai, uh, which was a, you know, we flew back that night after terminating the pregnancy, and then my wife went through 36 hours of labor oh, on a labor and delivery ward at Sinai. So that's, that's what we're asking patients to do a lot of times, uh, the ones that can afford to get care. Um, and uh, then you're dealing with, you know, everyone has seen you pregnant. Very pre pregnant's a very public thing. Uh, and then all of a sudden you're having to explain your situation to people, explain why you had to leave for a week. Usually the procedure takes about a week uh, when you fly into these places. So um, just the cost of travel, the cost of the procedure itself, which is, again, usually not reimbursed, uh, obviously, ensures that many people would simply not be able to get care and are then forced to carry pregnancies that are either unhealthy to the point where their life is actually threatened or forced to carry pregnancies that, um, that are non-viable, you know, through the point at which the pregnancy is, is finished. So we, um, I, I also just want to share uh, another story my wife and I got involved, and, and we found out about the Reproductive Health Act and efforts by people like in IRH to sort of fix this law in New York State. And um, we've been sharing our story as much as possible. We've talked to plenty of people in Albany about this. Um, and after about a year of doing this, we met another couple from Brooklyn that had to travel. Uh, they traveled in December, um, which meant that we had failed. So. Uh, I want to read um, her story, which has been submitted in testimony as well. Um, I was well into the third trimester of a very much wanted, planned, and healthy pregnancy when a routine OB visit turned into our worst nightmare. A scan had revealed that the fetus had not been developing correctly, mm -hmm. and I was rushed to a specialist for further examination. After a full and devastating day of meeting with the top medical professionals in their field, our worst fears were confirmed. The fetus, if it made it to delivery, had little chance for survival, and if so, would lead on excruciatingly painful and short life. Mm. My health, too, was now at risk. What followed was a painful decision between my doctors, my husband, and I that terminating the pregnancy was the best and necessary decision. After the heartbreaking decision was made, my doctors then told me I would have to get on a plane and travel across the country to receive the medical care that we all agreed I needed. I was shocked to learn there was a 24-week cutoff in New York, even when the health of the mother is at risk or with a non-viable fetus. It is often neglected to be discussed that many problems occur in the third trimester of pregnancy, even though it is more uncommon. It was a physically, emotionally, and financially excruciating experience. To have been provided health care I needed in my home state would have made a world of difference. I'm also acutely aware that we were incredibly lucky to be able to have the financial resources and supportive medical team to make sure that I was taken care of. Many women in New York are not this lucky, and that has to change. If not, it's not if this happens to another woman in New York, it's when. And that's the point. This happened, you know, a year and a half after ours, and we met them. These efforts are continuing to fail due to inaction in Albany, and we have to fix this. So I thank you for taking this up today and listening to terrible stories. Um, I'm going to use Chair's privilege just to thank you mm -hmm. 
every individual reacts to a tragedy their own way. You have it within you to share your story with others, but really you're just sharing the story of many other people. You're just able to come forward to let legislators and advocates know. So thank you for that. Thank you. You're doing, um, you're doing a mitzvah for everyone else. And, uh, you know, it's just so frustrating that legislators, there are those who can't hear mm -hmm. what you're saying. Yeah. But um, there are so many of us uh, who, um, while we've had other experiences, have not had that type of hellacious experience. And it's very easy for a legislator to say, oh, something like that is rare or really doesn't happen, so therefore we're just writing the language this way um, for another reason, but we need people like you to come forward to make it clear that, no, no, it does happen to people, and there is a reason why you would put in the language for not just the life of the mother, but for the health of the mother. Yes. So thank you so much for coming forward. Thank you and whatever you need to do. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations on Thank your you. Thank you. second full-term pregnancy. Please. Hello. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal, for convening this hearing today. And thank you, Public Advocate James, for introducing this important resolution before the committee. Uh, my name is Laura Riker, and I'm the Senior Program Manager at the Reproductive Health Access Project. We are a national nonprofit organization that trains and supports primary care clinicians to integrate abortion, contraception, and miscarriage care into their clinical settings. We're based in New York, and therefore we work very extensively throughout the state. Um, because our work focuses on primary care and primary care clinics, we see firsthand how uneven access to abortion is um, for folks in different parts of the state. Primary care providers are the main providers of health care in rural and medically underserved parts of New York. And I work with providers in areas of the state where access to specialized reproductive health care is severely limited, which forces many women across New York to travel for hours in order to get the care that they need. And lack of abortion training for these clinician populations directly impacts the ability of women in these areas to access abortion care within their own communities. Currently, there are 34 family medicine residency programs in the state. Of these, only five provide comprehensive abortion training, and they're on all in Albany or New York City. None of these residency programs are in state-funded universities or in public hospitals. And for non-physician clinicians, access is even more limited. Things would only get worse if Roe were to fall and we do not pass the Reproductive Health Act. We work to fill in the training gaps for these post-residency clinicians. So for example, last month, we hosted a medication abortion training in the city, which drew a large, large audience of nurse practitioners, nurse midwives, students, and family physicians who are fired up and committed to integrating medication abortion into their clinics. One woman shared that as a future family nurse practitioner, coming to this training would help her protect the autonomy and self-determination of her patients, which makes her a better provider. We work towards a future where abortion care is mainstreamed into routine health care, available in community health centers and publicly funded clinics. And being able to offer same-day in-office abortion services to women across the state is critical for not only maintaining but improving access. And the Reproductive Health Act would help us to ensure that clinicians in our state are able to continue providing these services, but also would expand access to training so that they can give their patients um, the care that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Emily Kadar, and I'm here today to represent the National Institute for Reproductive Health. Um, thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal, Public Advocate James, and all the committee members for holding this hearing today. As one of the organizations leading the fight to decriminalize abortion in New York State, NIRH strongly supports the resolution calling upon our state legislature to finally pass the Reproductive Health Act. The City Council understands that the Trump-Pence administration is determined to institute draconian policies restricting access to abortion and reproductive health care, and that the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court threatens to undo any federal protection of abortion rights. Given this immediate and very real risk, the state legislature must take action to update New York's abortion law by passing the RHA. Our state still treats abortion like a crime rather than health care, and there is too much at stake to maintain the status quo for yet another legislative session. 
Because our laws regulating abortion are so outdated, pregnant individuals who have serious complications later in pregnancy are sometimes forced to leave New York in order to get the safe legal abortion care that they need, as we just heard. Um, I also want to draw the council's attention uh, to the fact that the New York state law also contains a Civil War era criminal prohibition on self-abortion, which we were talking about a bit earlier, which means that women who end their own pregnancies can face potential arrest, prosecution, and jail time. And as a result, women who have ended their own pregnancies in New York have been arrested and charged under New York's criminal abortion statute. No woman should fear arrest or jail for ending her own pregnancy. And that is um, another provision in our law that the Reproductive Health Act would fix. Um, finally, I also just want to reinforce that the RHA would ensure that qualified health care providers, including advanced practice clinicians like nurse practitioners and physician assistants, can provide abortion services within their expertise and training. Uh, our law must reflect the reality of how care is being, uh, is actually happening here in New York State right now. Um, we need both houses of the legislature to pass this bill as soon as they begin session in January, and it must be a top priority. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal, for convening this hearing today, and thank you, Public Advocate James, for introducing the resolution before the committee. My name is Tashiana Diaz, and I am the New York City Associate Program Director for Peer Health Exchange. Peer Health Exchange, or PHE, empowers young people with the knowledge, skills, and resources to make healthy decisions. We do this by training college volunteers to teach a skills-based health curriculum in public schools, focusing on sexual health, mental health, and substance misuse prevention. In addition to addressing topics such as consent, and refusal skills. We also teach young people how to access their school-based health center or local community clinic for health care. After receiving our curriculum, 86% of ninth graders know how to access contraception versus 65% that have not received PHE. The resolution before you calls on the New York State Legislator to pass the Reproductive Health Act legislation that would update and improve New York State New York's antiquated laws around abortion. I strongly support the RHA and this resolution. At 20 years old, while I was nearing the end of college, I got pregnant. It was a terrifying experience. Not only was I in school and 100% incapable of raising a child on my own, but I was in an abusive relationship with the man who got me pregnant. Once I was sure I was pregnant, however, I was able to reluctantly get my mother involved, and get an abortion at a hospi hospital by applying for emergency Medicaid. Without that option, I would have been stuck in an abusive partnership and definitely not be in the place I am today, 14 weeks pregnant in a happy, healthy marriage, and at an organization that supports all people despite of race, ethnicity, gender identity. Continued access to these resources will possibly give young women like myself the option to not be forced to stay with their abuser. Also having programs like Peer Health Exchange who educate young people on consent and agency to make healthy decisions could also help in finding resources before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. One quick question. Um, are you aware of any New York City district attorney filing criminal charges against an individual or health care provider under the current law? So there was a case in which there were initial filed, uh, charges filed in Manhattan uh, a few years ago, which were, um, I think, fairly quickly dropped once the DA um, sort of recognized the possible ramifications of that, um, where criminal abortion was included as one of the charges. Um, but I know that some of my colleagues here are from the uh, CIA legal team, and they'll be able to talk, I think, more extensively about how um, self-managed abortion care, uh, the importance of making sure that it is uh, legally protected, especially right now under the circumstances that we're seeing federally. I, yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I will count on your uh, colleagues to testify about that yes. to make sure that's all on the record. Yes. Thank, thank you, you all very much. I'm going to call up the next panel.
Uh, we have Emily Gertz from the National Advocates for Pregnant Women. Um, Professor Cynthia Sauhu? Suhu from the Human Rights Gender Justice Clinic. Um, Farah Diaz Tello from uh, the SIA legal team. And Justine Khan from the Door, uh, a Center of Alternatives. Thank you. And if I could ask that Emily Gertz begin. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today and for this important resolution. <clears throat> the National Advocates for Pregnant Women secures the civil and human rights of all pregnant women, whether they choose to have an abortion, experience a pregnancy loss, or go to term. One of the perspectives we can bring to the chamber today is to remind the council and our allies that these archaic penal laws impact more than women who choose to have an abortion, but also can impact women who have pregnancies that they want to bring to term. I can share the story quickly of Ms. Renat Dre, who in 2010 was pregnant with her third child and desired to have a VBAC, a vaginal birth after cesarean. She sought a doctor in a hospital who supported her in her efforts, but when she went into labor, her chosen doctor was not on duty, and the doctor who took care of her did not share her desire for a VBAC. He pressured her continuously to have the cesarean surgery, and when she consistently and continuously refused, he sought the support of his superiors and hospital counsel to override her desires and force her to have a C-section. He wrote simply in her medical record, quote, um, Miss, uh, this woman has decisional capacity. I have chosen to override her refusal to have a C-section. Ms. Dre was wheeled into the operating room and surgery was performed upon her. Since 1973, abortion opponents around the country have worked tirelessly to restrict access to abortion by giving rights to fertilized eggs, embryos, and fetuses. And by performing an unconsented to surgery on Ms. Dre that morning or day, uh, not only did they strip Ms. Dre of her due process, they also stripped her of her fundamental rights, including bodily integrity and fundamental liberty. As, as Ms. Dre has sought redress for the violations she suffered through the court system, fetal rights have been used as the hospital's continued argument for why they felt it okay to perform this surgery on her. In fact, one trial court judge stated, New York, quote, recognizes an interest in the protection of a viable fetus by retaining the crimes of abortion and self-abortion. In other words, because of these penal laws, women do lose their civil and human rights during pregnancy. We urge the New York State Legislature to pass the Reproductive Health Act so that all women have rights, not only those who choose abortion, but those who also, like Ms. Dre, want to carry their pregnancies to term. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal and Public Advocate James. My name is Cynthia Stuhu, and I am the co-director of the Human Rights and Gender Justice Clinic at CUNY Law School. Our clinic has documented laws used to criminally prosecute women for ending their own pregnancies in the U.S. and critiqued why such laws violate the human rights of women. As others have testified, New York was a trailblazer in recognizing women's right to access reproductive health care. And New York City has also been a strong champion for women's human rights. However, the Supreme Court's recognition of the right to safe However, after the Supreme Court's recognition of the right to safe and legal abortion in Roe v. Wade, New York State failed to update its laws to repeal criminal abortion provisions. As a result, we've relied on prosecutors to exercise restraint and recognize that criminally prosecuting women for abortion is unconstitutional and violates women's human rights. Unfortunately, as our clinic has documented, in New York and other states, prosecutors continue to use pre-Roe laws like those in New York to criminally prosecute women for ending their own pregnancies, including in 2011 the prosecution of a New York City woman for allegedly drinking an herbal tea to induce an abortion. Given current uncertainty about the direction of the Supreme Court, it is imperative for New Yorkers to ensure that our laws reflect our values and commitment to reproductive rights, and in particular, that no one should be arrested for, or imprisoned for ending their own pregnancies. Recognizing the fundamental rights at stake, international human rights experts condemn laws that criminalize women for ending their pregnancies and consistently on call on countries to repealing such laws. Indeed, in 2017, the United Nations Working Group on Discrimination Against Women called on New York State to, to pass the Reproductive Health Act. 
The findings of international human rights experts confirm what our Supreme Court has said and what most New Yorkers already know. The ability to decide whether or not to end a pregnancy is central to the dignity, uh, the right to dignity and bodily autonomy. Human rights experts have also recognized that imposing criminal penalties on abortion constitutes discrimination against women. The experience of other countries with criminal abortion laws is instructive. In countries like El Salvador, emergency rooms and other medical settings have become sites of arrest and interrogation, subjecting women in su suspected of ending their pregnancies to mistreatment and prosecution, including women who have suffered spontaneous miscarriages and stillbirths. The Reproductive Health Act provides the opportunity for New York to once again become a leader in protecting the human rights of women. We strongly support this resolution and, and, and encourage passage of the act. Sorry, just one quick question on that before I forget. The, um, you mentioned the 2011 case. Mm -hmm. Is that the one that uh, Ms. Cater uh, reflected on a moment before with a case that the DA later dropped? I believe it was, and I think that my colleague Farah, oh, yes, Teo, is going to talk more Sorry. detail about that. Sorry. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, good morning, and <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to speak on this important uh, issue. My name is Farah Diaz-Teo, and I'm senior counsel for the SIA Legal Team, which works to transform the legal landscape so that people who end their pregnancies outside of the formal medical system can do so with dignity and without fear of punishment. And I want to focus on the parts of uh, New York's law concerning abortion that put us firmly in the back of the pack uh, in the rest of the country. As public advocate James uh, mentioned earlier, we're one of only seven states that retains a law criminalizing self-managed abortion. And of those states, we're one of only four that still believes that their law is enforceable. The rest have been deemed unenforceable by courts or by attorneys general. I noticed that it seems to come as a bit of a surprise to the committee that self-managed abortion is something that still happens and that it's not just a relic of our pre-Roe past. And the truth is that self-managed abortion has always existed and will always continue to exist for a variety of reasons. And those reasons might be uh, people who lack access or who have uh, well-founded suspicions about the medical, uh, medical system because of histories of unconsented medical testing, to fears about being harassed by clinic protesters. But they also may include reasons like wanting a private, more self-directed experience in the comfort of their own home. Um, you asked earlier how many people are having self-managed abortions. And the truth is we can't really tell because they only come to our attention either when something goes wrong or when, when a criminal prosecution happens. But what we do know is that research from the Texas Policy Evaluation Project found that among Texas women, up to 4% of women of reproductive age uh, had attempted to end a pregnancy on their own at some point. And uh, research into Google searches for terms related to self-managed abortions found that in the course of one month, more than 210,000 searches in the United States for self-managed abortion uh, had, had occurred. Lawmakers always ask me, how many arrests have there been? And I, the question that I really wish that they would ask is how many more women have to suffer the humiliation of arrest and criminal interrogation before we recognize the folly and danger of treating a public health issue under the criminal code? The women who suffer are women like Yarabelli Almonte, the Washington Heights woman who was arrested after drinking a tea allegedly to end a pregnancy. A uh, woman like a domestic violence survivor uh, named Katrina Pierce, who was arrested in West Monroe after allegedly taking a handful of, uh, of uh, over-the-counter pain medications in an unsuccessful bid to end a pregnancy and was still charged with a crime for it. The pattern that we see at the SEA legal team is that as long as there is a way for prosecutors to prosecute people for ending their pregnancies, they're going to find a way to do it. The time is now to fix this problem in New York's law. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you to the Council and Public Advocate James. My name is Justine Kahn, and I'm representing The Door and its Adolescent Health Center. The Door's mission is to empower young people to reach their full potential by providing comprehensive youth development services in a diverse and caring environment. Since 1972, The Door has helped a rapidly growing population of young people in New York City gain the tools they need to become successful in school, in work, and in life. Each year, The Door serves 11,000 young people from all over the city with a wide range of services, including reproductive health care and education, mental health counseling and crisis assistance, legal assistance, career and education services, supportive housing, sports and recreational activities, arts, and nutritious meals, all under one roof. The resolution before you now calls on the New York State Legislature to pass the Reproductive Health Act, legislation which would update and improve New York's antiquated laws around abortion. I strongly support the RHA in this resolution. The door agrees that in passing the RHA and thereby moving our abortion law from the criminal code to the health code, regulating abortion as the medical procedure it is, New York would be better protecting its residents. It would be better protecting its health care providers from prosecution. 
It would recognize and protect advanced medical, uh, advanced practice providers who perform abortions within their scope of practice. It would be pr protecting individuals fa facing major health complications late in pregnancy by creating an exception to the ban on abortion after 24 weeks. It would no longer criminalize women who self-manage their abortions. It would protect women from having to travel out of state for care or waiting until their health was in jeopardy before uh, having access to an abortion, all of which will be possible should the Trump administration overturn Roe. The State Assembly has passed this bill too many times, but has been blocked again and again by the New York State Senate and by anti-choice leadership. With our rights under attack at the federal level and states around the country restricting abortion access, we cannot afford to waste any more time. We need both houses of the legislature to pass this act as soon as possible um, in January. This must be a top priority. I thank the New York City Council and Public Advocate James for taking a stand and urging your colleagues in Albany to pass this Reproductive Health Act. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, I have questions, but I'm going to defer to the Public Advocate to begin. I just have one question for Ms. Tara Diaz-Tello. The cases that you cited um, are relatively recent cases of, based on the decisions were all of these cases prosecuted by local DAs or the Office of the Attorney General? Um, they were local DAs as far as I know. And in the case involving a Staten Island, um, the hospital, Staten Island University Hospital, who in that particular case, who prosecuted that case? That wasn't a criminal prosecution. Um, that was an act of medical malpractice, among other things. Um, it so, so it's a civil matter, yeah. So um, one of the arguments that the hospital has raised in that case is that they're justified in, prevent, in preventing harm to a fetus by any means necessary, including cutting into an unwilling woman. And in any of those cases, did any elected official intervene and oppose? Not that I know of. Thank you. Thank you, Public Advocate James. Um, Many of you have focused on the importance of repealing the provisions related to um, abortion in the penal law. Um, additionally, how can, is there an additional way that the city council can support the expansion of access to abortion? I mean, I, I think that the city council um, should be uh, spearheading efforts to make sure that there's access to services. You know, I, I think that also if we, um, Supreme Court, uh, if there's some, something happens to Roe versus Wade, mm -hmm. I think what we're gonna see is uh, more people coming to New York. Yeah. And I think that that's gonna underscore the need for us to expand the health services we provide to make sure that there are, are enough for New Yorkers and also for other women who might be forced to come to New York. Um, I also wanted to add, I mean, we were lucky actually that we have you, uh, most of you Preddy, who's from the UN Working Group on Discrimination Against Women, who will talk in more detail about why this is a human rights issue. But I, I want to add that um, the, the experience that the man testified about earlier, um, denial of, of an abortion for a woman who needs an abortion for health or because the fetus is un, un, not viable, um, that human rights bodies have said denial of uh, access to an abortion in those situations is cruel, cruel um, a cruel and degrading treatment and could rise to torture. I just wanted to add that the City Council can continue to remind people that abortion and reproductive health care in general is simply health care. Um, estimates are that one in three or one in four women will have an abortion in their lifetime. We know that about 84% of women who have abortions are already mothers. Um, so people who have abortions are not a separate group of people. They are simply people who need an abortion at one point in their life maybe have children before and may have children afterwards. So it's essential that we just consider this as part of the health care that 50% of the population may need to access in their lifetime. And Madam Chair, may I just follow up with one simple question? Yes, um, on all of the cases that were cited, did, um, the, did the women, uh, did she get legal counsel? Is she entitled to legal counsel anywhere? Is, uh, are, there, are there legal services for them individually? And if so, where? There should be. So for the most part, these are women who qualified for in indigent defense. Um, as we see, most, uh, most often people who are um, self-managing their own abortions are people who can't otherwise afford them. That's not universally the case, but it's often the case. So they may have access to a public defender. Uh, they are very unlikely to have access to private counsel. Um, but those are the circumstances that they're under. And I also, I'd like to, to the earlier question, underscore the point that decriminalizing abortion, right. finally delivering on Roe's promise to decriminalize abortion is an access issue. Um, the difference between a safe 
uh, self-managed abortion and a dangerous one is whether the person has access to information and access to, to, mel uh, to medical care and backup in case they need it. When people fear arrest for seeking help, they're not going to seek help. So this is, this is really a health access issue. And I'm particularly concerned um, about women outside of, I mean, New York City, obviously, there's a, a plethora of resources. But once you get outside of New York City, particularly upstate, um, we've got a lot of work to do. Thank you. Um, and I do just want to thank you for talking about how this is a human rights issue and let you know that uh, we did hear from uh, Renat Ore at our uh, maternal mortality hearing back in June. So I appreciate your referencing her again. Thank you. I'm going to move on to the next panel. Uh, we have Jesse Loesch from WHARR, Melissa Opredi, Opredi from the UN Working Group on Discrimination Against Women. We have Andrea um, Sawin Kapel, I don't think about pronouncing your middle name, from the National Council of Jewish Women in New York. Thank you all for being here. And Jesse, if you could begin. So thank you all so much. Um, and thank you everybody for testifying as well. And I know everybody knows um, how and why the RHA is vital, so I will skip that. Um, and really just say that New York um, has a storied history as a haven um, for those who need it most in so many ways. And we need to be that again. Um, and so war, uh, the Women's Health and Repro Rights Group um, is a subgroup of Get Organized Brooklyn. So in absentia, thank you to Brad Lander for creating that opportunity for all of us. Um, and I am a co-chair for WAR. Um, I'm also a preschool teacher and an interpreter for sex traffickers. And so when I was thinking of what to say and, and whose story I could tell, I realized that um, there were too many. There, there are too many stories that, that overscore the importance of, of why we need this. Um, and, and so the one that stood out is the one that's just the most recent. Um, and that is um, the story of one of the women um, whose children I have the pleasure of seeing every day in my preschool, um, twin boys who are two, um, and their mom, Rachel, uh, was pregnant again with another boy. Her husband was thrilled. I'm not so sure that three, she was thrilled with a third boy under the age of, of two. Um, and everything was going well for the first five months. Um, her twins came in every day with the story of being a big brother. They were drawing pictures. Um, Rachel had a routine ultrasound about three months ago. And they found that the fetus that she was carrying um, had no lymphatic or renal system, which was the reason that she wasn't um, showing so well and because the fetus was actually relying on her own um, systems to filter out um, the kidney, the poisons um, in his own blood. So the doctor said that should she carry to term, this was actually a, considered a viable fetus because he would live a few hours before ostensibly um, suffocating in, in those poisons, dying of blood poisoning. Um, so he gave her a choice um, to choose to carry to term and then watch this happen. Um, the other choice was that she and her husband had one day to make this decision because they were at the very end of this time period um, where this was legal. So they had to... Um, basically do all this at once. They had to grieve a very wanted pregnancy. They had to make um, childcare decisions. They had to make appointments. Um, and they had to explain to their boys that they would not be becoming big brothers, at least right away. Um, we have not caught up with science, with the times, and with human rights. Um, 
we have, you know, I saw my school go into emergency mode and take care of Rachel and of her boys and of her family. And I trust that we in New York State will do that again. But I don't trust that we will do that legally. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know that the assembly has passed this so many times. And I'm asking <laughs> that the Senate catch up and that we do this on behalf of Rachel and her boys and her family as well. So I thank you very much for your fight. Hello. Uh, thank you, Public Advocate James, for uh, introducing this resolution before the committee, and thank you, Council Member Rosenthal, for convening this hearing today. My name is Andrea Salwin Kopal, and I am the Executive Director of National Council of Jewish Women New York. Um, we're known as NCJW New York, and we are a grassroots organization of volunteers and advocates who turn progressive ideals into action. Um, we are inspired by our Jewish values to strive for social justice and improve the quality of life for women, children, and families, and to safeguard individual rights and freedoms. Um, and we think it's very important to be here today. We are a 125-year-old organization, and I suspect that for that entire 125 years, we've been working for reproductive rights and justice for women um, as an integral part of women's equality. Um, we think that as a faith-based organization, we have a special role to play in this issue where, as we all know, um, anti-choice advocates claim to have God and faith on their side. Um, our official testimony in the record, of course, echoes everything that people have said about the importance of this legislation in updating New York State's antiquated abortion laws, the, reason why, the reasons why that's important and the ways in which it does that, so I won't repeat that here um, since my, my colleagues and our coalition partners and uh, lawyers and, profess and professors and doctors have done that so very well. Um, but I did just want to conclude by saying that uh, NCJW New York is committed to creating a world where all people, regardless of race, class, gender, sexuality, ability, or immigration status, have the right to choose whether and when to have children, to build their families, and to live their lives with dignity. Our Jewish values teach us that reproductive freedoms are integrally bound to our religious liberty. We are committed to advancing the goals of reproductive justice such that all people can make their own moral decisions about their bodies, their health, their family, informed by their own religious beliefs and their own faith. And that is why we will continue to work with our coalition partners in this fight to finally see the Reproductive Health Act passed and signed into law. And once again, we thank you. Can you hear me now? Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Council Member Rosenthal and Public Advocate James. Uh, my name is Melissa Upriti, and I am a special mandate holder appointed by the United Nations to examine laws and practices that discriminate against women. And I'm a member of the United Nations Working Group on Discrimination Against Women in Law and in Practice. Um, in 2017, the Working Group sent a letter to the United States urging the passage of the Reproductive Health Act in New York. And as set forth in the letter, which is available publicly, and I shall send you a copy later, uh, the working group um, expressed concern about measures taken by states that undermine women and girls' equal rights to health and specifically their right to reproductive health, as well as their right to physical integrity. Such measures run contrary to international human rights standards and to the obligations undertaken by the United States, including through its ratification of the International Covenant on civil and political rights, also frequently referred to as the ICCPR. One particularly troubling aspect of New York's current law governing abortion is that it criminalizes women who end their own pregnancies. Criminalization of abortion and the failure to provide adequate access for the safe termination of an unwanted pregnancy constitute discrimination on the basis of sex in contravention of Article 2 of the ICCPR. 
the working group has called for protection of the right to safe termination of pregnancy in the context of the right to life, enshrined in Article 6 of the ICCPR. The criminalization of termination of pregnancy, as we can tell from the stories this morning, deters health officials from carrying out safe abortion procedures, thus increasing the number of women resorting to unsafe methods of pregnancy termination. Ultimately, criminalization does grave harm to women's health and human rights by stigmatizing a safe and commonly needed medical procedure. Also, such provisions deter women who have had abortions outside of a clinical setting from obtaining help if complications arise. The working group is of the view that criminalizing the termination of a pregnancy instrumentalizes women's bodies, undercuts women's autonomy, and unnecessarily, as well as unjustly, puts their lives and health at risk. As we have seen here and across the world, the treatment of abortion as a criminal matter often produces harmful collateral consequences, including the imprisonment of women who have had miscarriages. Criminalization of self-induced abortion raises concern about the impact on low-income women who, due to limited means and reduced access to health care, are most likely to seek to terminate their own pregnancies and consequently most likely to be harmed by the current legislation. In the last few years, a number of human rights mechanisms have moved to requiring decriminalization, including as an immediate obligation of states. Criminalization of abortion has been deemed a form of gender-based violence that, depending on the circumstances, may amount to torture or cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. There is no doubt that women's access to safe abortion is critical to their ability to realize many other fundamental human rights. The right to equality and the highest available standard of health care and the right to non-discrimination in access to health services, including those related to sexual and reproductive health, require specific protection. Equality in the supply of health services requires a differential approach to women and men in accordance with their biological needs and the right to safe termination of pregnancy is an equality right for women. Punitive measures must not be enforced against women seeking to make decisions about their health, safety, and well-being. On behalf of the working group, I would like to say that we do indeed welcome this resolution and urge New York State to pass the bill in order to ensure that women's most basic human rights are guaranteed and that abortion is decriminalized. To do so would be consistent with international human rights law. We are watching and the world is watching. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have copies of your testimony? I do, and I shall email the same. Very good. Thank you. I was Thank just you. wanted to make sure. And I have a quick follow-up question for you, given your wider perspective, um, obviously, working uh, with the UN. In the US, according to researchers at the University of California, San Francisco, American women who are denied an abortion struggle more financially than women who undergo the procedure. Women denied the procedure are less likely to be uh, working full time one year later and are more likely to be receiving public assistance and living below the federal poverty line than women able to obtain an abortion. Can you tell us more about the connection between reproductive freedom and economic opportunity? Um, well, I think the two are critically linked, and that's why the right of a woman to control her fertility, the number, spacing, timing of her children has been recognized as a human right. And the denial of that has been recognized as discrimination, which percolates into every aspect of her life, economic, political, and otherwise. And it is amply clear that women who are not able to control their fertility also are not able to avail of opportunities to participate in the workforce. And aside from that, there is the whole issue of unpaid care work. The fact that a lot of work that women do is simply not valued, there is no monetary value assigned to it, that doesn't mean that women are not working and their work is not of value. It just means that we live in an economic system that has an androcentric bias that does not 
put as assigned that kind of value. So the link is clear. I think it's just that it has not been adequately established through research. Um, but you know, that's something that needs to be addressed. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your testimony. We're going to call up our last panel. Um, we have Anne Danforth from Raising Women's Voices New York, um, Odile Shal Shalit from the Bridget Alliance, and Mira Kurzer from the New York City Bar Association. Thank you. If you could all give your testimony to the Sergeant at Arms, and we will begin. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal, and thank you, Public Advocate James. My name is Odile Shalit, and I offer testimony today in support of Resolution 84. I do so with many years of experience working with individuals seeking abortion care, as a full-spectrum doula, as a social worker, and currently as the director of the Bridget Alliance. The Bridget Alliance is a support service that provides assistance to people who are forced to travel to seek abortion care. We help individuals cover the considerable costs for transportation and housing, provide funds for gas and tolls, and refer people to local practical support networks where they exist. Over my career, I have assisted countless numbers of women in accessing abortion care and, informed, and informing them and counseling many who were beyond the gestational limit. This experience has shown me the enormous barriers women face in accessing abortion care in New York State. The law as it stands has resulted in gross inequity for and inordinate burden to New York State women. This is due to the gestational limitation, the restrictions on who may provide abortion services, and the pervasive fear of persecution. While it may seem unbelievable to many of us here, though not in this room, in New York City, many women in New York State live in hostile environments where it is hard to identify and access trustworthy, supportive providers who offer a full spectrum of care. Given these barriers, the reproductive destinies of these individuals vary widely. Some of these women will pursue their care, often taking long treks from upstate New York to New York City, an often unfamiliar voyage. They will leave children, jobs, partners, dependents behind. They will be forced to disclose their very personal experience and needs to unsupportive individuals. They will be burdened with the myriad financial costs of travel gas, tolls, parking, bus, train, plane tickets, hotels, meals, medications, childcare. All of these additional burdens have the potential of creating emotional stress for these women, which may even force them to abandon their plans to find the most appropriate care for themselves, all of which could have been avoided if there existed safe, supportive, and expert care in their local area. Because of the gestational limit, others will have to leave New York State and travel even further across state lines, as Mr. Marshall discussed. Many of these individuals are faced with the deeply complicated experience of grief that comes from discovering a fetal anomaly or a health issue that complicates the viability of a wanted pregnancy or the safety of a mother. It is unnecessary and cruel to cause this additional pain by forcing such a person to surmount the even greater logistical challenges of traveling so far away. Um, there's so much more, but I'm out of time. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, so just to, finish and to say, uh, the Bridget Alliance is proud to provide this work, but simply put, we shouldn't have to exist. So we need this revision to this law. Thank you so much for hearing my testimony. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you to the council and to Public Advocate James. My name is Mira Kurzer. I'm the co-chair of the Sex and Law Committee at the New York City Bar Association. The City Bar has a long-standing commitment to upholding the principles of individual liberty and supporting the constitutionally protected freedom to make public health care, private health care decisions and reproductive choices. We reaffirm this commitment by supporting City Council Resolution 84, urging the New York State Legislature to pass and the Governor to sign the Reproductive Health Act. Although the New York law enacted in 1970 includes an exception for performance of an abortion after 24 weeks when a woman's life is at risk, the law currently does not contain an exception for women's health or for cases of fetal non-viability. Accordingly, it fails to comply with United States Supreme Court precedent requiring that statutes governing abortion permit abortion at any time prior to fetal vi viability or in cases where a woman's health is at risk. 
As others have testified, this has resulted in a significant obstacle for women who find themselves in the tragic circumstances of needing an abortion later in pregnancy due to a severe fetal anomaly or a risk to their own health. On a personal note, I am currently 27 weeks pregnant, which puts me past New York State's 24-week cutoff, which would leave me with no recourse under the penal law should my pregnancy become a danger to my health or should my fetus become diagnosed with a fatal abnormality. In addition, New York's continued criminalization of self-abortion stands as an outlier in the nation. At common law, even when abortion were, was considered a crime, it was not a crime that a woman could commit upon herself. New York State is one of only seven states that elected to break with that tradition, and even among those outliers, the Ninth Circuit has ruled at least one self-abortion ban unconstitutional, another has been declared unenforceable by the state attorney general, and a third has been declared unconstitutional by a federal district court. A further note, by only authorizing abortions performed by a physician, New York law has placed an obstacle in the path of advanced practice clinicians acting in their lawful scope of practice in the provision of early non-surgical abortion. There is no valid medical justification for a physician-only limitation, as leading medical associations have endorsed the provision of abortion by appropriately trained APCs. Clarifying this legal ambiguity is critical, particularly in rural areas of the state where providers are few and far between. Finally, New York's law contains archaic provisions that have since become obsolete or been held unconstitutional by subsequent Supreme Court decisions, including the criminal ban on the sale of contraceptives to minors and the requirement that second trimester abortions be performed in hospitals. The act conforms New York's law to current jurisprudence by repealing these obsolete provisions, which are not currently followed in practice. The New York City Bar praises the City Council for standing up for the reproductive rights of all New Yorkers and joins in its call for the legislature's swift passage of the Reproductive Health Act. Thank you. Thank you. I know the public advocate has a question. Sure. In your Thank you, Madam Chair. In your testimony, you talked about the um, outdated and harmful uh, facets of New York's uh, abortion-related penal laws, and you made reference uh, to uh, several cases where it was declared unconstitutional one by the Ninth Circuit, the second one by the Attorney General, and the third by a federal district court. Can you just elaborate a little bit, particularly as it relates to what were the circumstances by which they were determined to be unconstitutional, and particularly um, in uh, that one example that you cited involving the Office of Attorney General? I apologize. I don't have the, the details in front of me at the okay. moment, but I, they are in part of the appendix to the testimony that we've submitted to the Council. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, uh, current public advocate Tish James. Um, and with that, I'm going to call this hearing to close, but I thank everyone who came together today to educate uh, this body about the work that they've been doing. And uh, I want to let you know, on a personal note, how much I appreciate the work that you are doing and urge you to be patient and uh, not give up uh, so we can we can actually pass the Reproductive Health Act. Thank you very much.